Hello, Tom. How are you? I'm great. It's been a great morning here. Uh, how do you see a happy retirement? Because uh, I read in your book actually the words of your of your wife, and she said that you're golfing, dancing, <laughs> cooking, painting. I have all the list here: fishing, landscaping, reading, and even making a wine. Is it a recipe for a happy retirement, or how do you find time for investing then? Yeah, I my wife's uh, forward of the new book is probably one of the most popular chapters in the entire book because. It, uh, she let me have it with uh, all that goes on in my personal life and all that, which was, it was okay with me. It, it is what it is. And I think retirement obviously is different for different people. But for me, it's doing some of the things that when you were working and, and boy, was I working. I mean, my Trendstat days were, some days were 16 hours, a lot of times traveling around the world. A lot of my currency clients were in Europe or Far East and uh, a lot of time on planes, a lot of ability to read books and, and try to catch sleep where you can and change time zones and everything else. But when you, when you retire, now your time is your own and you can, you know, uh, yesterday morning I was working on a, an idea I had for investing. So I spent three, four hours dealing with extra work in the investing area. But uh, yesterday afternoon, for instance, at about, uh, I think about five o'clock, we went out and played nine holes of golf. And it's sort of just, you, you sort of uh, schedule your day around different types of activities that amuse you that you really couldn't do. If you're not here all the time, you know, I'm not in Scottsdale or in uh, Payson, Arizona, where I am right now up in the mountains you can't really take dance lessons. So I always wanted to learn how to dance. I have a very good friend up here in the mountains that was on American bandstand back in the day. And he grew up in Philadelphia and he, he would dance with all the kids, teenagers. Uh, he's now you know, older than I am. And uh, so this was very early American bandstand, but he was always smooth on the dance floor. He always seemed to be having a good time. And I thought, hey, he's not a rocket scientist. I should be able to figure this out. And uh, so, you know, one thing led to another. I took dance lessons. I met Brenda at dance lessons. So, uh, you know, one of my other interviewers uh, titled his whole his whole interview, blame it on the bossa nova, which was a famous line from a movie way back uh, when, or uh, I think it was a, a song actually. And, you know, making wine, uh, I've always loved to sing. I sing in a choir, I'm a bass voice. Uh, baritone probably be my sweet spot, but I can get down to bass. And interestingly enough, basso, my name is bass in yeah. Italian. So, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, the basso voice of the choir is me. All right. All uh, right. So, but all the other things I do, I love to golf. I love to work out. We've been doing a lot of, in the hot summer of Arizona, we've been doing water aerobics and we make up our own. We've, we've gotten books and tried to figure out certain exercises, but it's amazing how when you're pushing against the water, it's so gradual on your muscles that the next day you just feel tight. You don't feel sore. And one of my biggest gripes as I've gotten older about working out is that the next day, you know, getting out of bed is tough sometimes. It's, you know, I'm pushing 69 now. And uh, man, I, if I do a good weightlifting session or, uh, uh, you know, 45 minutes on the elliptical on 10, you know, I'm pushing pretty hard. I'm sweating profusely and I'm feeling good. But boy, the next day, oh man, it hurts. And so I like the water aerobics. And when it's a hot summer day in Arizona in the desert, it's kind of something nice to just jump in a pool and do all your exercising and stay cool at the same time. You don't even break a sweat. So in meanwhile, I'm breathing heavy. I mean, you're really out of breath and, uh, and all that. So to me, retirement is filling your time with things that you never had the chance to do, that you always had that hankering to do, but now you do have the time. And I think you have to embrace that and go for it. I don't think just sitting around watching the television or, you know, staring at a screen all day. 
I don't stare at a screen all day. That's the last thing I want to do. I did a lot of that most of my life. Uh, so I want to be outside. I want to work in the garden. I took courses in pruning and landscape architect just so that I could understand more about working with all the plants in my at my house. And just I have a lot of interests and uh, cooking. I took cooking classes. I didn't know anything about cooking, but I'm I'm always hungry, especially when I'm working out a lot. So might be nice to know how to throw together a dinner. And now I'm putting on four or five course charity Italian dinners paired with wine for people that will pay a thousand dollars to a charity so that they can come to my house and let me cook for them. And uh, that's kind of fun raising money for good causes and get to meet new friends and, and uh, get to, you know, test myself with pushing the envelope on cooking. So lots of things. I, <laughs> All of them are unrelated, but I guess the only common thread is that they take time and my intellect, and I really enjoy them. And they're things that I really couldn't do back in the day when I was on a plane going to Japan or something. So, Sounds really uh, great. Yeah, it's been good. I really, I'm a poster child for retirement. I love retirement. And on top of these all activities you mentioned here, uh, you're also still an active investor. So. Uh, how much time you have to dedicate just purely to manage your own account? Because now, uh, after retirement, you're just only uh, managing your own account, right? That's correct. Uh, I have two accounts, an IRA and a personal account. And Brenda, my wife, has an IRA and a personal account. I have four accounts. Right. And uh, hers are pretty easy, uh, the way I do it. And uh, mine are a bit more complicated. My IRA is fairly simple. Uh, some uh, ETFs and um, a position in an all-weather fund that I'm the chairman of, Standpoint uh, Funds. Uh, I've got some of that in my IRA, and that's a great way to, to take care of some futures exposure in my IRA without having to manage it myself. And then uh, on the individual side, for me, that's where I really concentrate my efforts uh, because that's where the money would be, where we would live off of and, you know, pay the, you know, the normal monthly fees for various things. And so I try to do a good job of that. Now, if I'm doing some research or come up with an idea, like I did, like I said yesterday, I was working on an idea. And one of the ideas that I had that caused me to work for three, four hours yesterday was to replace some of the markets that I trade where I only get, say, one contract because my account is not infinite. Mm -hmm. And things like, for instance, lumber have been moving so fast that their volatility is so great that you're down to one or zero contracts with the dollar size. But a lot of the markets are coming up with micro contracts now or mini contracts. So uh, I think there's a crude oil contract that's now half the size of the big guy. So if I'm trading one or two contracts of crude in my normal uh, contracts, I now could trade four. The reason that's an advantage is that if you've ever read my book, uh, Successful Traders Size Their Positions, uh, Why and How, I've got all the math in there. Uh, what ends up happening is when you get into a trend following move, your return to risk is the best that it's ever going to be for the rest of that trade. It'll never get better on average. Could get better in an individual mm -hmm. sense, but on average, taking over thousands of trades, your best return to risk ratio is the second that your trend following model goes over. Given that, and given a market like, say, lumber or uh, a crude move that goes crazy or anything, stocks, what will happen is you've got a stop loss. You've got the market taking off through, through the top and you're buying into it. As this market accelerates, if you can't move your stop up as fast, look what's happening to your risk is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that can eventually come back and hit your stop on certain situations. It's not going to go forever and it's probably sooner or later is going to stop you out. So what I figured out a long time ago when everybody in the industry was looking at my return to risk ratios is that your next drawdown always stops, starts from your equity peak. That's when your risk on that trade tends to be very, very high. 
if you don't cap that someplace and peel off some of your positions so that you have less positions on, you're going to end up with starting your drawdown with a full bore, a full bore position that's going to end up slamming you when it goes the other way. So in order to reduce drawdowns, I figured out that if I could set my, my uh, risk limits at some reasonable level, both on the portfolio and on a position, I could end up peeling off trades. Well, if I start with four or five, I can peel off one and still have three or four. And if I can, then I get more risk, I can peel it off and go to two. If I'm starting with one, I can't peel anything off. There's right. nothing to peel off or I go to zero and don't participate in the trade. So in order to try to smooth performance, I'm looking more at the micro and how much uh, additional trouble that would be and whether it's worth my while. So it, it re, re, I ran some simulations. I did some thinking going through the specs of the micro futures. And the other thing is I get so many questions from traders who are starting out with say 25,000 or, or less even. And they ask me, well, how can I do a futures portfolio? And I'm inclined to say, you know, back in Trendstat, the, the smallest we would accept was a million dollars. It's kind of hard with some of the contracts doing what they're doing with the volatility that's out there to think of trading smaller futures portfolios, you're going to be very over leveraged. And but with the micros, you know, you've got some like gold is one tenth of the uh, contract size of the normal gold contract with their micro gold. Silver has got a one fifth size uh, COMEX position at 1000 ounces instead of 5000 ounces. So the exchanges are starting to wake up to the small investor. I really like it. And so I wanted to really dig in and find out who is offering micros, what are the specs, so that in the future, when I get these questions from new traders, I can point them in the right direction and say, you know, you got to check out the CME group. It's got a lot of micro contracts that are looking pretty good and you could get your exposures down. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I did yesterday morning. But other than that, a normal day, half an hour, 40 minutes. All right. All and I that's spent. it. And that's it. Okay. Um, I had you already on my podcast almost three years ago, um, and I'm glad I have you another time. And um, there's a good occasion for that because uh, there's a new book uh, by Michael Covell, um, Trend Following Mindset. Uh, could you please tell us a bit ab about that new book and also... What does it mean to be a trend follower and to have such a, such a mindset of trend follower? Yeah, the, the trend following. The, first, let's start with the book. The Michael is is a great interviewer, as are you, uh, as I pointed out before we started. And Michael's always very well prepared, but uh, he does not tell me at all what he's going to talk about. And we have such fun. Uh, he Surprises. and I have uh, very similar attitudes towards a lot of things. And we, he just hits me with these off the wall questions. I just love them. So we, uh, I think we've done it four times or something like that. I know he's had four podcasts, but one of them is what he calls the super Basso episode, which is, I don't know, like four and a half hours or some crazy amount of interview all at one shot. And so he and I, he, he can call me from anywhere in the world and off we go. And usually an hour later, we wrap it up. And we, we decided that a lot of people just aren't into listening to podcasts. They like to see the hard copy. And he's had all sorts of suggestions from people that will listen to his podcast to say, you know, I would love a hard copy. I would read your podcast, but I can't listen to them. I don't, I don't like listening in the car. I don't listen while I'm working out. I need hard copy. So Michael says, well, then you're going to have to have somebody transcribe it yourself because I'm not going to do it. He's just adamant. He likes his, his audio. He also doesn't do video. He, mm -hmm. he very rarely has ever done a uh, zoom type things except for public speaking. So, he uh, he has his little niche that he's done, and Lord knows he's very successful at it. He's uh, uh, he's way up in the millions and millions and millions of views, and uh, so we decided, you know, we've got all this material, and I said so many interesting things. Why don't we take that as a starting point, combine it together with another interview I did, 
wrap in a forward from my wife, wrap in the research that was on my webpage, try to pull together a lot of good material for traders and put it in one place. So they have sort of a reference. They, they can underline things physically. They don't have to remember that it was at 23.21 in the, in the audio uh, broadcast. They can say it was on page 100, you know, and they can even mm. put a little tab there if they want or a paperclip. And uh, so things about position sizing, the mental side of trading, things that I've said over the years, it seemed like if we could pull it together and put it in one place, it would be fun. Now, we called it the trend following mindset because a lot of the interviews in the book um, are about the mental side of trading. And I always say there's, there's really three parts to trading that are identifiable easily and that you could say are essential to the basics. The, the first is what everybody spends time on, which is the buy sell engine. It's you know, I'm going to buy when the moving average crosses. I'm going to buy when it goes through the Keltner band. I'm going to buy when it's oversold uh, and, uh, and the RSI stochastic gets to 20 or whatever. Everybody's got their own buy sell engine, but the buy sell engine needs to trigger you to act and buy or sell. That's fine. And everybody spends all their time looking for the perfect one or a combination of them. And I would say that's the least important thing in trading. The second area which i think a lot of new traders because of their capital or because of their lack of knowledge do not address is the sizing of the positions that's why i wrote the book and charged only ten dollars for it and everybody could afford it and it's got all the math in there that we actually did at trendstat in the real world so it's a great book to get a, an understanding of what position sizing is about it's not the only way that you can position size but to me it's one of the simplest so that a normal new trader can do it. Uh, you could get into some very complex position sizing, but I think it's beyond the scope of most traders. That's more important than buy sell engines, it turns out. Uh, if you randomly flip, flip a coin and run Monte Carlo simulations like I did back in the day, but have great position sizing and trail your stops and do all the things right with a simplistic little moving average, uh, flip, flip the coin, uh, at the end of the day, buy the next morning or sell the next morning. And just once you're in, you just move your stops up. Uh, I showed a slight propensity to produce a profit over like a 20 market portfolio in futures. It was not highly profitable. I would not want to trade that as a trading strategy, but it proves the point to me that sizing your position is far more important than just worrying about where you buy and sell. Because if you can get on a trend and, I don't know, gold goes from 500 to 1,000 or 1,500 to 3,000 or whatever it wants to do, you're going to make a lot of money. And whether you got in today or tomorrow or yesterday, not going to make a lot of difference. The third area and the most important area is what most of the mindset book is about is the mental. Now, why is that? I'm a systems trader. You know, you could, I, I just said that it takes me maybe 20 minutes to 40 minutes every day. And I'm running eight strategies across 20 something futures markets, index stock and in, uh, stock indices, four different stock indices. I'm running uh, one on a futures on cr a cryptocurrency. I just started up uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, haven't even done the first trade on that yet. Uh, I run two different ETF portfolios, but one by momentum and one by trend following. And uh, one's a sector and one's more momentum based. And I do all that in 20 minutes to 40 minutes. I'm very systematic in how I do it. Well, why do I have to worry about my mental side? Well, because with Tom, the human being, there's all sorts of ways I could step in and screw that up. I could say, you know, I don't feel like doing my work today. Everything, we had a good day. You know, the positions aren't really very close to my stop. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and go out and play golf. I don't need to worry about it. And of course, that would be the day. The next day would be the day that everything turns and, and crashes. And then all of a sudden your stops are not where they should be and everything's messed up. And uh, there's, you could always step in and say, you know, I don't feel comfortable. Lumber just went up, 
you know, like five straight days limit. I only got one contract left, but I don't feel like, you know, keeping or staying around with this. I'm going to take my profit. What's that? That's the mental side stepping in and being greedy and thinking about what, what that means. And I think that, so, so you see how if you, the person can't even run the systematic, then you're lost. So all the same bus- buttons get pushed on me that get pushed on any trader, which is potential greed, potential frustration, potential uh, anxiousness about a position or uh, fear. You have to learn over time how to deal with a lot of that. So the trend following mindset really is uh, an attempt to try to explain that you need to be able to get into a position you need to help yourself by controlling your position sizes and controlling your buy sell engine so that it fits you the person your situation your capital needs your your uh, skill levels do you know math or not do you know computers or not do you uh, are you trying to day trade? You're trying to trade over a month. There's so many different aspects. Take an inventory of yourself. And you are completely different than me. So there's no way that both of us should be trading the same exact approach. One of us would be very uncomfortable. If I traded what you do, I'd probably be uncomfortable. I'm totally comfortable with what I do because it's designed for me in every aspect. And I've taken a lot of time to design it for me. When I was back in the business, I designed everything for my clients, not for me. So I'm trading different than what I would do for clients. If you force me to trade client money today, I would change what I'm doing. And um, I'd back off the risk a little bit, back off the volatility. I'd probably expand the markets. Um, I'd probably go a little more long term. There'd be a lot of that type of stuff that I'd have to modify to suit my average client. And I think that's what people miss about the mental side of trading. It's so important because if you're not comfortable, sooner or later, a sleepless night's going to get to you and you're going to have enough pain or enough uh, greed or whatever. It's going to come in and and rear its ugly head and you're going to end up uh, modifying your very systematic approach and you've just, you're no longer a systematic trader. Right. Right. I even saw words by um, Larry Hyde on the cover of, of uh, following, uh, Trend Following Mindset. And he said that anyone can make a lot of money without the trend following mindset, but you will never keep it. So basically... <laughs> <laughs> so Larry's said, a good guy. Larry, Larry <laughs> is great. I, uh, Larry is the inspiration behind the early stages of my uh, risk controls that went into the book, actually. And he did not share those with me. I just read Market Wizards. And as being the mathematician and engineer that I am, as I was reading the chapter, uh, and, I, and I had some trades that had gone over in the previous month or two, and I'm reading the chapter, and he's talking about keeping every single bet size time after time the same. And I immediately saw math of, okay, I can do a risk in each trade divided by the equity so that I know how much money I have in my account. I can expose a certain amount to it and I can do that math and figure out how many contracts I should put on. And that would keep the bet size relative to my equity the same. And I later uh, developed after the famous silver trade, which was also covered in the book uh, and also covered in new market wizards, Mr. Serenity chapter um, with Jack Schwager, uh, I, I covered, uh, you know, the the volatility was way too much on that trade. So I used the same concept. I thought, hey, it works great over here, risk risk side. Why don't I look at controlling volatility too? And then later on, when I was trading euro dollars uh, for Trendstat, I was thinking, wow, you know, if the volatility is low and the risk is low, I could get a humongous position in euro dollars and all it's got to do is have an interest rate move or something and i'm dead i should put a margin limit on it too so i put a margin to equity just like i have volatility to equity and a risk to equity that controlled everything and then uh then you could sleep at night and just do your job and and keep cranking it 
Um, do you only trade using a trend following approach or do you also maybe use some short term approach like a mean reversion? You, you mentioned already about the momentum, so I will get back to that in a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, just are you using something which is, uh, let's say, like mean reversion, let's say shorter yeah. term? Yeah, I would say, uh, yes, I am using a wide variety now. Lawrence Bensdorp is a friend of mine down in Brazil and uh, runs the Trading Mastery School. And he and I do some seminars every now and again. And just sitting in those seminars is inspiring to me because you have a lot of great minds, 12 great minds in one room. These are many times not brand new traders. They're pretty seasoned and they're trying to take it to uh, sort, some sort of an ultimate level. And Lawrence and I switch off every other hour and a half, I guess it is, so we can rest our voices because it is a fairly exhausting for two days being imagine. up in front of a room talking about trading. And uh, But, you know, I sit there and listen, and Lawrence wrote an excellent book on automating your stock portfolio that talks about multiple systems trading. And he's a big proponent of long-term trend following, but he's also a big proponent of blending in other strategies like mean reversion. And I think the book's excellent, easy to understand. I, I recommend it to a lot of people. Uh, and what that book has inspired me to do is to think long and hard about how do I fit into my own comfort levels, the concept of diversifying by strategy. So the first and easiest way to do that, I found, was to go from my longer term trend following with futures, let's say, to look at a shorter term time frame, very, very shorter compared to the long term. So that was the first area of diversification was by time period. And that was easy to do. And it's basically using some similar trend following triggers, but over a much shorter time frame. So you're going to get uh, very, very different um, return streams. And sometimes when you're pulling back and a drawdown on a long-term position, your short-term position's already flipped and you're basically neutral. One's losing, one's gaining. And when they both kick in, then, they, then you really rock it again. Uh, so that was one thing that was easy to do. The second thing I decided right out of the gate was unlike Lawrence, pure mean reversion to me, it means you are literally... Um, you know, like in an example of a buy and you got, say, uh, uh, an RSI stochastic or something. Mm -hmm. So you're going from zero to 100. The market comes down. You're looking for a buy. It's below 20, still going down. And you've got to put a limit order in to buy it under the market and hope you get it and hope it goes the other way. That is just not me. I just don't. I I would rather do something like, okay, I'll, I'll see that it goes down to 20. And now I know I need to buy. I'm going to trigger myself like above the previous day's high or something, uh, a three day uh, average of something or a one day, two day average of something, uh, you know, the, the breakout of the last two days, or I don't know, something that's so small and short term that it looks to the outside observer sort of like I've got a mean reversion, but I'm really very, very, very short-term trend following. And that just feels more comfortable to me and I know where to put my stop and I don't know, it, it fits my mentality so that I can continue to do it. Lawrence loves his mean reversion and he, he does very well with that as well. We both had good years last year doing very different things. So, yeah, but, but as you said, it's very important to to have the strategy which is really fitting into your nature and that you can feel comfortable with it. Yes, that's that's the perfect summary of that. Um, so I, that's what I've ended up doing now is to try to look for new markets and new sort of overbought, oversold, very short term, sort of mean reversion looking uh, guys that uh, I can blend in. So I've added an extra ETF program. I've added um, some index trading uh, that I would almost call counter trend. Uh, it's from overbought, oversold conditions and always trying to go the other way. Uh, I've blended in one Bitcoin future just to start experimenting with that, to see if there's enough liquidity. There seems to be enough volume. I don't know how... 
uh, trend following on a very short term basis is going to work there, but it appears like there could be some potential. So we'll give it a try. It's not going to hurt me or help me that much uh, to get started, but then it's one more return stream. So what I'm looking for is unrelated return streams. And Lawrence, as a way of, uh, of saying this that I think is so perfect, if you ever looked at an equity chart, it never goes straight up the page. It always is, you know, a little, little, and then sometimes there's a little bit of a bigger one, right? A little down and up. And if you leave it alone and you keep following your strategy and it's well thought out, you're probably making new highs sooner or later. You just have to have that patience, which is the hardest thing to do on the mental side of trend following in the mindset area. So what he calls it is filling the holes. The drawdowns are the holes. And just like you would fill potholes out in the street by shoveling something into them and, and kind of topping them off, if you really examine that time period that some of your existing strategies went through and what did they do to struggle? What types of markets were they trading? What, uh, what type of strategy were you using? How long was it and all that? What, if you were to just design a strategy with perfect hindsight that would tend to be a math that would tend to make money during that hole, that drawdown, and maybe some other drawdowns as well, it wouldn't have to make money, a lot of money, over the very long run, like your big trend following models might, the core positions, the whatever is really the engine driving this uh, equity curve going up the page it's designed to try to fill a hole. And if you think through your rules enough and you really design it so that its job is to fill that hole, if it doesn't fill that hole on the next hole out, you know, it's, it didn't do its job. You can develop math, for instance, that uh, like mean reversion that ends up trying to offset some of the trend following early trend following losses with mean reversion profits. Now, if you get a, then a big downswing and it's a steady down and a panic down, you're going to be trying to buy with mean reversion. You're going to lose on mean reversion. So you got to be very careful to not create other drawdowns with your mean reversion that are offsetting your trend following profits. But that's a matter of, of sizing your strategies, um, dealing with the sizing of positions and so on. But I found that to be a very fruitful area of research that I've gotten into where I can do sort of hole filling uh, projects that end up expanding the number of strategies I do, but not really expanding my time too much. If I take a like a stock index and go to a stock index trade because my ETFs are longer term, if I do stock index trading on a short term basis, then I can be short NASDAQs at the same time my momentum strategy might be still coming back to its stop losses, loss points, and they're, they're sort of offsetting each other. So what I'm constantly trying to do is if one thing I know has got a uh, Achilles heel or a soft spot where it's going to tend to draw down, what other strategy can I design that tends to make money during that but won't cost my returns too much? during the rest of the periods. So that's been the, the largest amount of research lately that I've done. You mentioned about momentum and um, I wanted to ask you more about that because what's the main difference between momentum and trend following? Because the core idea seems to me uh, similar, right? We are looking for some momentum on the market, but I know also that, okay, trend following is using mostly is based on uh, trading primarily uh, futures contract. Whereas momentum often is used also for ETFs. Now it's easy to uh, trade uh, indices using ETFs. So as you said, for example, there is a problem for people with a smaller capital if they want to trade contracts, but maybe it's easier for them to use ETFs. Mm -hmm. But what's the main difference between these two approaches? All right, I would qualify what you said a little bit differently. I would say that momentum and trend following purely are sort of two different um, two different forms of trend following. So I would call trend following sort of a grandfather of a lot of different math that falls underneath that large category. Right. 
momentum to me is you're trying to find, say, ETFs or stocks that are moving really well compared to the rest of the universe. And you would buy them when they're moving very well and looking like they're increasing in their momentum. And once they uh, fell on hard times or ran out of steam or whatever, out they go and the new guy comes in. You just keep hitting the fast moving. Well, aren't you then going with the strength and cutting your losses short with the weakness? That's trend following. So trend following is more of like an, uh, to me, a label that could apply to an awfully lot of different maths, moving averages. To, you could use uh, trend following with Keltner's, Bollinger's, Donchin channels, uh, moving averages, uh, high low price ranges. Um, there's just a ton of, um, if you go to investopedia.com, you'll see about a hundred different indicators that you could probably use to trigger a buy or sell. So to me, trend following is a little bit more of the label over all these things. Momentum's a specific subset of that. So what I'm doing with my two different ETF approaches is in one case, I've selected one sector fund with a very low cost structure, lots of liquidity in each of like 20, I think it's 23 different sectors, if I remember right, something like that. So I identified a precious metals ETF. I identified an emerging markets ETF, a, you know, a technology ETF, an aerospace ETF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then what I use is uh, I use just pure buy sell engines, trend following over. Uh, I use it like 21 days to get in and 50 days to get out because I feel like it should be slanted to the upside. I make it harder to get out than to get back in. And uh, that worked really well during COVID. It got me out of everything during the crash and it got me right back into everything fairly quickly on the upswing uh, last year, which has helped drive my right. very large returns last year. The, that I call trend following. And I think that it's just using buy sell engines, position sizing and away you go diversified portfolio. I know I've got 23 different sectors I'm trading, so covering a wide base. Then over in the momentum side, what I decided to do is take another chunk of money. And I said, let's go into uh, some screeners that I've got at my broker and gear them so that it measures the last 30 days of relative strength versus the universe. So it lists the highest, I don't know, 50 uh, ETFs by that criteria. So all of a sudden, a Russian ETF will pop in or, I don't know, like a uh, computer hacking, uh, computer security uh, mm -hmm. uh, firm will be up there, or an ETF that specializes in cybersecurity, or another one could be extremely mega capital, high cap stocks all of a sudden comes in and they, you can kind of see themes coming in, which has kind of been fascinating because I've been doing it for a few months now and I've noticed the, it definitely kind of changes, you know, all of a sudden I'll get a whole bunch of cyber security stocks and they do well. And then all of a sudden uh, some other area starts showing up and I'm into now, you know, mega capital stocks or something or tech stocks or emerging markets or country stocks or whatever. Uh, and I, so it's been fascinating, but what I do there is I buy the new positions that show up. So buy a small position of them. And then I put a trend following stop behind them. Or if they fall off the top, uh, if they get to basically 60 or less on relative strength, they're just, they've lost their mojo they're out. Mm -hmm. So I've had as many as, uh, let's see the maximum. I think I had like 25 positions or something in the portfolio. Right now I have 10 after mm -hmm. yesterday, Ye yesterday was, uh, was a fairly big down and it stopped me out of several. So and are you rage religiously following all the signals or you mm -hmm. have some room for, let's say gut feeling that, or no, the signal stops, is signal stops are in the market. Right. I, I'm stopped out. And I don't even know I'm stopped out until I All do right. my work at the end of the day. I'm already out. 
All right, I, I understand. I, I'm doing something else. I'm doing an interview or whatever. <laughs> I can't be sitting here trading while I'm doing an interview. Sure. I mean, um, as you're a systematic uh, trader, investor, um, but there is one, one problematic thing, uh, namely, if the market is changing, um, you may be asking, I mean, investor may be asking a question, uh, are these changes so significant that maybe the model has to be changed, adapted to these new changes? Um, so first of all, how do you see that? How can you tell that this is the moment to change uh, the model? Because that's also, you know, that could be also um, a way how to avoid following the, the strategy, just constantly modifying it. Um, but on the other hand, there may be a moment when indeed we have to do it. How do you approach it? My <clears throat> tongue in cheek answer to that is it, it, it's got to be your models have to be doing something that you would not expect them to do given the market conditions that you're facing. So one of the reasons why I'm so adamant with traders, new traders always want to say, well, how do you do it? You know, what do you, what indicators do you use? What markets do you trade? Well, you know, they all want to clone me. And I keep telling them, you're not me. Don't clone me. Design it for you. The reason Another reason you want to design it from ground zero is that you want to be able to understand what you're doing so well that when you see the market do something and you say, you know, given the market action that's going on here, I should be making money, but I'm not. Something's weird. And you dig in and you start realizing that, you know, that one little thing that you did way back when was is going to affect you. The, 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 the strategy that you have with the math that you have is not going to handle what this new thing in the market's doing. Like the meme stocks, for instance, um, you know, uh, somebody says AMC should go up and they publicize it on a bulletin board. That's a little bit outside. If you're doing a momentum play, well, then you're going to be in on AMC stock, right? It's shooting up 600% or 6,000% or whatever it is. And uh, so you have to try to figure out, okay, that's something new. That never, there was never bulletin boards that could have that kind of impact on the market. Uh, how do I incorporate that into my strategy or deal with that? And that's a good time to, to think about making changes. Other than that, if you... If you're just losing money, let's say, on a strategy, the, the temptation is, is to change it and to say, you know, if I had done this instead, I wouldn't have lost as much during this drawdown. And so I'm going to modify it. But what you don't realize is that you're already you're already doing uh, uh, a strategy that spanned lots, you know, decades on your simulations or whatever. And now just one little thing causes you to change it you're going to be changing all the time right. and you're going to find that that's going to cost you on other markets where your old strategy that you hadn't changed would have done better and then you're going to be just frustrated and because you're going to kick yourself saying oh, yeah stupid me i shouldn't have changed it and you're in this mode where you're just put, setting yourself up for failure setting yourself up to get mentally beat up and uh so if it's not broken don't fix it and but if it is if there are new things coming in that you can identify then there's room to and logic to try to go through a process to start from scratch go back and simulate go back and and incorporate whatever this new whatever hole filler is and uh, off you go and then you can trade that in the future so there is a time to think about changing i haven't kept every strategy uh, this, exactly the same for, for everything. But I, I will say this, my buy sell engine for my futures right now is exactly one of the strategies we used at Trendstat back in the 80s. Right. So, but, but on the other hand, the 20s, that's 40 something years now I've been using the same still thing. working. Well, it works right. better sometimes. It works worse some of the other times. But it, it, you know, the thing is, I, in the seminar, I, I have a graph that uh, is so, cool to show because I, I have five different buy sell engines and I have some market like crude oil and it's going to break out and have a big run. I knew that. And I pull it off of my broker screen. And then I, 
I laid these five indicators on there and I show where they all break out on that one trade. And they're all within two days. They're all either today or tomorrow. They all break out. And the breakouts are all this little tiny area on the chart. Meanwhile, the chart, the, the, the crude oil market goes, you know, huge. So why are you quibbling and obsessing over whether you bought it here or bought it there? Right. You picked up all of that. That's what counts. And I think that's what people lose sight, especially if you're sitting there all day long, the new traders that don't have anything better to do and they're trying to get better at their craft. They sit there glued to the screen and they get mesmerized by all this noise. And I think that they, they can't pull back from that and think strategically because their, their emotional buttons are getting pushed constantly. I would advise people if there's any way to do it is to trade during the trading day and i'm talking trade like systematically mindlessly whatever by you know follow your strategies if you're a discretionary trader develop some rules and be a good discretionary trader focus do not start dreaming up new ways to trade during the trading day close it down you're all done sit back look at your log of your trades look at your uh, any ideas that you wrote down and start developing and thinking of strategies when the markets are completely closed and the emotions are uh, done and uh, you don't have anything pushing your emotional button or giving you extraneous ideas that are just based on noise. Uh, that's not fruitful. Uh, by the way, I found in your book um, an article which you quoted uh, which says that uh, actually the title is "If we are so smart, why we aren't? Uh, why aren't we rich?" And it tells about people with a very high um, IQ, which produced very low returns. Which apparently seems like the IQ is not correlated with the returns. <laughs> so I, I have a great story on that one. I ran into a PhD mathematician at a conference and he listened to my talk on trading strategies and stuff and we kept in touch uh no it, it was a actually after the trading uh actually the seminar was over or whatever and i was done speaking and he came up and we were chatting he said i have uh, i'm a programmer i'm a mathematician phd in math uh i i've been having a real struggle trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And I said, oh, well, tell me your story. And he said, well, I came up with a basic strategy and then I, I added some other things to it and I added some um, position sizing and I added more markets and I've added additional uh, strategies now. And I've spent the last two years doing nothing but simulating. And I said, well, how come you've never traded? And he said, well, I don't feel like it's finished yet. And I said, the way you're going, it's never going to be finished. You'll never, ever take the first trade. You got to get out there and, and figure out what the real world works like a little bit, how your models react to it, adjust, come back and do it again, you know, and get better and better. And he had no clue, but he was brilliant. I mean, he blows me away on math. I'm pretty good with math, but I was never the valedictorian or anything. I... I, I can handle calculus and a lot of pretty severe math, but uh, it's not my favorite thing. I can understand it at best, and uh, I can always refer to some place to figure out what I don't, I can't remember uh, from college, which was 45, 50 years ago. And uh, this guy was brilliant and never even made a single trade. That's that's so perfect as an example of what not to do. You, you want to come up with something that's simple, yeah. easy to reproduce that you really, really understand. I have another example. My former partner a long, long time ago was doing mutual fund timing and he used to write down rules in a little book. And I came back from a trip and he had, he had, you know, we'd done some trades and, you know, some trades were losers, but then he, he'd say, you know, if we had done that, we wouldn't have had that losing trade. So he'd write another rule down and he had rules and rules and rules. And if this, you got to do this and that's got to be, the volume's got to be this. It's got to be hitting new highs. It's got to be hitting this indicator. And it just kept getting more and more complicated. I came back from the trip, walk in the door 
And I said, hey, uh, did we go along the mutual funds? And he says, no. I said, huh, I would have thought we would have got a signal by your rules. He says, no, let me show you. He pulls out the book and he starts going through, starts reading them out to me. And I said, okay, so that would be a positive. Yeah. Okay. So that would be a positive. Yeah. And, and, and that would be a positive. And then he gets to the final one and he says, and, and then this, and I said, so we should be long. And he goes, Oh my God, I missed the trade. <laughs> he had made it so complicated. He couldn't right. even figure out what he was doing anymore. Right. And that just, I shook my head and walked out of the room. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, there's just no point to making something complicated. It doesn't add value over the long run. Uh, Jack Schwager has a term called degrees of restriction mm. that I love. The more parameters that you put into a strategy, the more you restrict the strategy from being robust and being able to react to different things. You could make a strategy with so many rules and it, you know, you got to have the stochastic below 20. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to you know, you have 10 different rules. You'll never get a trade because no trade will ever achieve all those things at the same time. Or you'll trade once or twice a year. What usefulness is that? It's, it's just not going to help you very much. So I think keeping things simple, trying to keep your parameter sets as low as you can possibly do to get the job done is a very useful thing. I like Jack's term, degrees of restriction. That's, yeah, that's exactly what it what it seems to me to be. But yeah. still, people prefer complexity over simplicity. And even as uh, there was a saying, uh, the complex things, are easier, it's easier to sell them also. And people, they think that more complex solutions are better, which is mm -hmm. typically the opposite. If you yep. have a simple solution, it's better. And you, you don't have to even check. Uh, you can even calculate in your head probably mm -hmm. sometimes. So Exactly. Uh, and, and you can feel it and you can understand why you are opening a position, not just because you have to calculate some uh, funny uh, formula. But There you go. <laughs> thanks, Precisely. But, um, is this time different? Because, you know, I often hear that, well, okay, so I have a, some strategy. It, it, it worked fine in the past, but now with, you know, all this money being printed, everything will be different. Or maybe sometimes people are even involving the politics biases towards trading and stuff. Uh, so first of all, um, is this time different if we consider indeed this um, action which is uh, taken by the central banks? And do you think that it may indeed affect or maybe already did um, the, the markets and eventually the models? What, what I find is that throughout my, what, pushing 50 years of various forms of trading in my life, you know, it always, I've heard that statement asked of me numerous times, is this different? Uh, you know, the crash of 87. 23% down in one day. I lived yeah. through that. Um, you know, the two Iraq wars, the, uh, you know, oil goes from 32 to 40 and ends up the next morning at 22. Uh, lots and lots of things that people think are different. And yet what happens to the markets? They move, they go up, they go down, they go sideways. Yeah. Um, uh, with that much money coming in, you could argue that you're creating inflationary pressures and you're creating a bias to the upside. Uh, because if $10 uh, or a 10 PE, a dollar of earnings, uh, and the stock sells at 10, it's a 10 PE. If inflation makes the value of that dollar worth 50 cents, then all things being equal, that same company might make 20 uh, or $2. And if it sells at the same PE, it would be at 20. Well, if you bought the stock at 10, it would be worth 20. Now you'd make a hundred percent. And that extra money that you just made didn't change your life at all. Your net wealth is the same because the 20 spends the same way that the 10 did, but mm. you could have made a profit on the trade. So I think in terms of trading, I'm a little more biased the way governments around the world are. It's not just the U S but, yeah, a lot of the ECB, uh, European Central Bank, and uh, and so on. They all seem to be trying to, I don't know, get an economy going. When they're making moves, 
and being they're setting their governments and their budgets up to be, I think, anti good economy and then trying to spur the economy on by pumping more money. It's the wrong approach. Let the economies do what the economies do and you don't need to pump any money. Then you have real growth that's sustainable and um, beneficial to people. But that being said, I'm not running the ECB or the Fed. So as a trader, I'm sitting there saying, you know, if this causes the market, stock market to just keep going up for the next five years straight, I'll be long. I'm a trend follower. I don't care. Right. Right. If, on the other hand, this whole thing caves in and we have a 80% down in the S&P 500, I'll be short. Right. Right. So I may not like that as a human being, because I suspect if if the stock market in the U.S. drops by 80 percent sometime in the future, I think the normal person's life is not going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have uh, that could be uh, yeah. at least a recession. It could be a depression. It could last for years. Businesses could fold. Jobs could be lost. Homes could be lost. It could be really ugly. But from a trading standpoint, which is what we're talking about here, there's no reason why large movement to the downside couldn't be exploited just like large movements to the upside. So to help protect your own portfolio and your own personal life, you have to think both directions and you have to be ambivalent. You have to be able to say, you know, if the market goes down, I'm going to go with it. If the market goes up, I'm going to go with it. Quit, quit predicting with your biases uh, politically or economy or what the interest rates are going to do or all those things, get out of the predicting game and get into the trading game, which is to say mm. right now, the market is very near new highs. We've had a couple of days off. It's up again this morning that we're doing this interview on. And uh, so I guess I'm, you know, long, I'm enjoying the ride, you know, whatever it is. Right. As you say, the market will do what the market will do. Exactly. Um, but by the I way... love that. Even my <laughs> wife is used that when I tell her what the markets are doing in the morning. That's what she comes back with now. She she puts these words that I say back into my into my um, ear. Um, I actually uh, also used this saying because I wanted to talk about uh, the active and passive approach. Okay. Um, because, you know, um, people who are following passive approach, they also may say that the market will do what the market will do. And they are just buying and then holding the, the market uh, forever. Um, or at least they think they will. Um, how buy do you and pray. Buy, buy and, and pray. pray. Sometimes it converts <laughs> to that, indeed. If, if you have a collapse 50%, then... And if that lasts for years, then you have to good, really... Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, so how do you see that approach? Because um, on the other hand, the the Boglehead or what Jack Bogle did uh, or the index, uh, index um, investing is also very popular and becoming very popular. Uh, how do you see that if you compare to the active approach? Well, uh, I'll talk about a number of different topics here. First of all, I believe the reason why it's become so popular is there's been a huge upward bias in the last even couple decades to the stock market. So it makes sense that if you uh, are working as a busy doctor or a, a lawyer or an accountant or whatever, you just don't have time to sit there in front of a computer. You don't understand the markets. You barely know what a stock is. Just go buy a, a a Vanguard index fund and away you go and Bogle gets some more money uh, in his funds. And, uh, you know, that that works great when you have a, a strong upward bias, as long as you can stomach the declines along the way. As recently as COVID uh, crash uh, for like 32 percent or something on the S&P in a very short amount of time, that that kind of hits the mental side again. And a lot of investors probably sold out and said, you know, the stock market's not for me. I, I just took a hit of 30% of my money. I can't afford to lose anymore. I'm out. And uh, then, of course, they missed the, the beautiful run up. And that's the problem with that strategy is psychologically, it's not lined up with what most people have as their wishes. Uh, most people would be like my dad who bought CDs at a savings and loan and thought he was avoiding all sorts of risk, not realizing that all the savings and loans could go bankrupt. But his returns was a straight line, never went down. He always made his interest. 
and the CD would come due and he'd roll it to another CD. That was the extent of my father's investment program. And uh, that's what people would love to have, except they would love to have it be 20% a year, straight line. Uh, good luck with trying to find that too. And uh, so the reason, I'll, I'll talk about risk a little bit. There's a lot of people that buy and hold and guys like my father who go into CDs or in real estate or all these other different places you can stick money that take the attitude that there's risk out there. And by doing this, whatever that strategy is, I'm going to kind of avoid a lot of risk. I'm going to be in real estate. Real estate always goes up, right? It's not going to have risk. Well, you have risk. You just don't have a price in the Wall Street Journal every day or on a quote machine of your real estate property going up and down. But if you were to sell it on any given day, it might be worth more or less on a given week or month or day. And uh, it's just that stocks and futures and currencies and stuff like that are quoted tick by tick so or pip by pip. And uh, so... The way I look at risk is, and the, the reason I like trading and why I think trading to me psychologically is easier on me, is that I'm not ignoring risk. I'm saying, yes, there's risk out there everywhere. Risk of leverage, risk of defaults, risk of uh, corporate risks, risk of market crashing, lots and lots of different risks. But what am I doing? I'm attacking those risks. I'm designing strategies to say, I know the market could go down 80, 80 cents on a dollar, leaving me with 20. If I'm buy and hold, I'm going to have $20 for every $100 that I put in. But if I trade and I say, okay, I'm going to come up with a trend following model that will measure the downside. And when it gets to this point, I'm throwing on index futures hedges. And I'm going to make money as the market falls to offset the losses that I'm taking elsewhere. So I'm attacking the risk, knowing that I can attack that risk and knowing that I am going to do it because I'm disciplined and I've got the systems in place and the stop orders are sitting there on the screen right now. I know that if today's the day it all caves in, I'm covered. So I can be Mr. Serenity. I sleep well at night. I know I've identified as many risks as I can handle and I've attacked them. I think that makes a lot more sense to me than to, to ignore them and to say, okay, I'm going to buy and hold. And yeah, I know the stock market could go down, but I'll just try to hold forever. And then when it happens, you can't do it. And you're, you're trying to put it either out of your mind or ignore it, or you're trying to hope that it doesn't visit you. That's a terrible way to invest. Right. Um, in your book, you put a chapter uh, titled Timing the Market Revisited. And there you just um, outlined that basically it's not only about the profit you make, but also how deep the drawdowns can be. So, for example, if you can have, let's say, 10 percent annually, but in the meantime, you have 20 versus 50 percent maximum drawdown. That's a big difference. Sure. But, is. but on the other hand, um, people who are towards index uh, uh, index funds, they say that, for example, they um, quote a SPIVA S&P index versus active report when they say that, look, uh, after 15 or 30 years, uh, most mutual funds, they are below the index. So as a proof for the fact that basically the active investing doesn't work um, and if we just okay I know trend following is using the, the the futures contract but if we just take mutual funds why do you think indeed they are losing against the market because that's the fact I mean most of the I'm not saying all funds but most of the, these funds are indeed below the, the the average the the reason for that is and I think Bogle realized it way back when with the Vanguard was probably a, the biggest proponent of this is that the large mutual funds with billions and I never managed billions. So I didn't have that problem, but uh, I would have had it if I've got gotten up that large. And I think that when you are up in the billions, you are forced to buy a lot of the big names because there's enough volume and capitalization so you can afford to own them in your fund and gobble up a lot of these assets that you're required to keep fully invested. And there's a lot of legal requirements if you study, and most people don't. But being in the money management business, I had to deal with the SEC and the 
and the NFA, National Futures Association. And these rules sometimes force investor investment management's hands on how they can approach putting money into their mutual funds and what stocks they can buy and so on. So because of that, if you start tracking a, a portfolio of a very large cap mutual fund that's actively managed, and over here, the index fund that has very, very low costs to the investor and low costs of transaction because it just sits there in the same S&P 500 stocks, you're going to see that the index fund has maybe a, anywhere from a percent to a percent and a quarter or something like that many times advantage. So yeah. over time, that's an extra burden that the active manager who's really owning about the same stocks that the index fund has got. Yeah. It's hard for him to get ahead because he's carrying an extra three quarters to 1%, one and a quarter percent to pay for all of the things he's got to go to do his active stuff, to commissions, to market the fund and everything else. Over here, the index fund just sits there and just does its thing and doesn't, doesn't have to move or cost commissions or charge a lot or anything because it's mindless. And um, that's why that happens. But now if I take that same index fund and I give it to the average, my dad, who doesn't like any fluctuation in price, and you put them through a 50% down, uh, you know, a, a 2000 crash of tech stocks, 2008 real estate debacle that everything fell apart, 50 cents on a dollar, the 30 through 2% COVID crash. I mean, my, a guy like my dad could never live through half of that. He'd be, he'd be done with it. He would never, ever get in it again. If you take and time that same index fund and cut that drawdown down substantially, and give him some of the upside that would give him more money than his CD, he would be a happy camper. And this mm. is what a lot of managers miss. The, the big Wall Street types, they're used to rolling in the risk and gambling and whatever. Uh, I remember Van Tharp said something like 30, 40% of all of the traders out there in the world on Wall Street would sort of certify for Gamblers Anonymous. I mean, they're just gamblers. Yeah. Well, if you if you take all those folks and you look at how they structure what they do versus what the average person wants, there's a mismatch in many, many, many cases. When I designed what I was doing at Trendstat, I was always trying to think about my clients and what they would want, not what I would want. I trade differently today than I did at Trendstat because I'm this is I'm got me as a client now. And I'm a different client than my average client. I know too much. I know a lot more about risk. I know a lot about more about risk management. I know a lot more about futures and markets. I mean, I could never convince my father to get into futures. That'd be ridiculous. He, he wouldn't even, because he's heard that that's dangerous. He can't even believe that I got involved in it. Well, I've been doing it 50 years. It's not any more dangerous than you make it. You can make it dangerous or you can make it so boring that it's like, watching paint dry and you can dial it in anywhere in between and where I dial it in is for me now it used to be I dial it in for the clients and I think that that's um, something that a lot of money managers are very egotistical and they trade the way they want to trade because it's the way they think you know the world should go but their clients can't handle it and they don't see it and um, but so they end up bringing money in and out it goes, bringing money in, out it goes every cycle. And they, they never figure it out. But do you see a place for passive approach for all these people who are, as you said, doctors or people who are really dedicated to some other activities in life and then do, they don't have even time to check daily uh, their accounts. And if they are aware of the fact that indeed there can be a decline like 30, 50 percent and they indeed are okay with it. So in such, uh, in that case, would you see it as a valid approach or you don't? The only way really I can like see it, it <clears throat> the only way I can see uh, an outside investor, outside the mutual funds, buying and staying with something is, is things like, and I'm not saying we're the only one that did it, but I'm, I just became uh, a couple years ago, uh, chairman of standpoint funds. 
Standpoint has 75 different futures markets along with 50% global ETFs buying hold. Why do we do that? Eric Crittenden, who's a brilliant guy, he's the chief investment officer, said, look, if I get exposure to 75 global markets that could go up or down and I can exploit them two directions, and then I have these ETFs over here, isn't that what most people are trying to expose themselves to, to get diversification in today's world? But the problem is they can't get it in today's world from very many places. There's a few of us out there, but there aren't very many that can cover that much ground and then allow the investor to just buy the mutual fund that is doing all this thing for them at a fairly low cost and then just hold it because we're taking care of attacking all at risk for them. Then they don't see the ups and downs like, like the normal investor out there buying the Vanguard S and P fund. And therefore, their mental side is placated and they're allowed to be a strategic investor and just think of the long term and they don't get that shocking experience along the way. So we've done that with Standpoint at great expense, by the way. Oh, my gosh. $500,000 to form the fund. It, it, the lawyers involved in trying to create an Act of 40 fund with all this stuff in it uh, are getting rich. They, it's unbelievable. But we finally pulled it, pulled it off and started it up on January 1st of uh, 2020. Had a banner year last year, having a banner year this year. Uh, made it right through the COVID crash. I think they were down like 8% or something. It was something very small compared to the market. Uh, I forget the exact number. Uh, but nothing that's going to scare anybody. And then caught the up move, made a bunch of money there. So... That type of fund, and there are, there are a couple of other ones out there like that. I know Milburn has a, a couple of funds. They're getting pretty large. I don't know how much effectively they can move. Um, Milburn, a bunch of good guys I knew from the futures industry. I, there's a few others out there. I don't know all their names, but you can seek those types of situations out to try to get to sort of an all-weather fund that you could buy passively and hold it. But inside there, there's a lot of active stuff going on. That'd be where I think would be the best fit for most normal people out in the working world. I just don't see the average person being able to, I don't care if they tell you, they swear on a Bible that they can handle a 50% down when it actually happens. No, so I understand <laughs> when they get that, down to half of that, 25% down, they're already getting nervous. So I can see that dividend investing is also not your, <laughs> not your favorite approach then. If you're just doing that and nothing else, there's no uh, timing of the investment. You're going to expose yourself to some fairly severe drawdowns. The dividends are not going to cover it. The dividends, the higher the dividend, the more you're likely to have uh, less movement up and down. Uh, dividends become sort of an anchor, uh, as in the case of a boat, where you've dropped the anchor, and that's the dividend. The larger that if you're paying eight, ten percent dividend out of a company, a utility or something, it's going to really be hard to move that very much uh, up or down in price. So you're buffering your downside some, and you're of course getting dividends, which is helping cash flows and and uh, bring keeping your portfolio somewhat buffered. But you still, in a if you if you assume the stock market goes down eighty <laughs> percent, those high dividend stocks are going to be down thirty, forty, and for a, a normal dividend person that really is a little gun shy and thinks he's doing dividends in an effort to try to buffer the the downside, he is helping himself some, but not as much as he might think, and uh, he might still might want to have some hedging approach or uh, ability to, I don't know, buy puts or do something that would help offset some of the declines that he's likely to suffer over the next couple of decades. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, we are reaching slowly to the end, but um, I remember it was a year or two years ago, I think, uh, you put on Twitter um, information that you're looking for some programmer, that you're starting <laughs> up some project. And um, 
And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to ask you, uh, has this project taken off and uh, what was it or what is it actually maybe? It was related um, to trading as far as I, I can't, remember. I can't tell you the name of it yet. Um, I was testing it uh, yesterday afternoon. It is not ready for prime time. Uh, I am working with a programmer up in Michigan and uh, we're building a cloud-based trading platform that will have a subscription model to it. It'll have data included. I, I did go on the website this morning and looked at yours. Um, and perhaps if we, if you want, you, I'd be happy to uh, uh, take a look at it and beat it up a little bit and sure, give me my, sure. my frank comments. If it's useful for you, I can try to do that for you. Thank but you. Um, I've done that to a number of trading platforms, by the way. So I'm getting pretty used to how I go about beating trading platforms up lately. Um, we're going to try to be able to trade futures, ETFs, and stocks. Um, it will not have anything day trading wise coming out of the gate. It'll be all once a day position trading types of things. Um, it should be extremely fast. The servers, depending on how much you want to bump them up, can really fly. So doing a simulation for like uh, 10 years of data across 21 ETFs uh, with say three different indicators, position sizing, algorithms, everything, you know, less than 10 seconds, you'll have the results back and, and uh, you can debug it in spreadsheet form. You can get a graph, you can see which markets, how the profits and losses by ticker. Uh, so you can see where your losses came from, where your gains came from, helps you go out after that hole and see what uh, what's going on there and if you can puzzle over that and improve your trading a lot of mm -hmm. interesting re return to risk statistics um, pretty easy to use should be intuitively obvious for most people so that's kind of the goal where we are and how soon it'll come out i have no clue i i've given up trying to figure out a date that uh, i think makes sense to me because it just we keep finding things that we have to make better but uh it's better today than it was six months ago. So, you know, right. at some point uh, we'll have to pull, we'll have to say, okay, this is good enough. We're going to have to go out in the world with it and, and see what happens. But uh, that's where we are right now. So I wish you good luck with that. And yeah. please let me know when you are, when you launch it. Um, I'm very interested about it. Yeah. Um, is there anything else uh, that maybe I didn't ask during our conversation that you would like to share with us here? Wow. Uh, just that uh, I'm having a great time. Uh, some of these interviews uh, uh, have been a lot of fun. I meet people like yourself who are fascinating people and uh, make new friends around the world. And, uh, you know, when I was back in the money management business, it was focused on Trendstat and it's just, you know, grinding. And I have to say, I have a lot more smile on my face uh, today than I did back uh, even when I was retiring and just deciding to not even trade for a whole year. I took a, tr a year and a quarter off from trading. And the only thing that got me back in was my wife uh, coming to me uh, after I we got engaged. And she says, you know, I guess you probably should manage my portfolio since <laughs> you're this legendary trader. And so I took a look at it and we, we started managing money again. And I didn't manage for other people, just for her and myself. And, but what I'm finding is I really enjoy keeping in touch with people around the world. Enjoy the ride dot world uh, on my shirt here is a fun thing to do. You know, I've got all these interviews that I've done are all in one place at enjoy the ride dot world. And I'll try to, when you get done with this one, I'll put links to it as well. And I, if some new trader wanted to just get a sense of the psychology of trading and some of the philosophies of attacking risk versus passive risk, differences between trend following and mean reversion, other things. Gosh, there's so much good material out there that uh, on just my interview page, it's all free. And you can just listen to it. And from there, I like, for instance, in your case, when you when I put this interview up there, I'll have a, a key or a link to the specific interview, but I'll also have a link on your logo over to your page. And you have lots of podcasts. 
So now you can go off and listen to all of your podcasts, or you can listen to Covell's podcast, or you can listen to, you know, Aaron uh, Feifeld. Uh, there's just so many other people who have interviewed me that uh, a lot of good material there, and it's all free. All right. And I will put it to the show notes. The, the, rec the recommended link. books. Uh, Gosh, there's just so many different things uh, and resources out there for new traders that I never had. Gosh, we didn't even have internet stuff going on back in those days. Back when I started, you had to call your broker. They had to call a floor. The floor wrote up a ticket. A runner <laughs> took it out to the pit, gave it to a trader, <laughs> had to execute it, throw the execution down on the floor. The runner would have to get it off the floor, take it back to the side, call back the broker, and call me it might take 45 minutes wow <laughs> now now you just do it live and you can see the fill uh about a second or two later and real uh, time yeah yeah i mean it's insane the, the world's a very different place but it still operates the same it's still buying and selling it's still trends it's still ups and downs and sideways um the timing of everything with computers has gotten faster and where the New York Stock Exchange used to do 10 million shares a day and pop the champagne cork. Now you do a billion shares a day. And uh, so a lot more volume. Computers can handle it. Um, but the world's the same. All right. Um, Tom, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed that. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the listeners also will find a lot of value in what you said. Um, so... Thank you so much. And as you say, enjoy the ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enjoy the ride. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.